All right, so um, welcome back. Um, hopefully everything is going pretty well for everybody. Um, just want to remind you that there is a quiz today that I'll be turning on at 11, or sorry, at uh, 1230. Um, we'll get to the point where we kind of cut class a little short and you can go in and start doing that on Canvas, but I'll remind you about that when we get there. Um, but uh, I already had a request for a homework question, and so we're going to go ahead and look at that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can um, all see what the homework problem is. So let me just get this up real quick. All right, so everybody should see my Canvas page. And we'll go ahead and go into the assignments. And um, we're going to look at 7.2. So 7.2 is the um, using the trig functions to find angles and all that good stuff. And uh, the request was to look at the last one on 7.2. And I think this may have been the same one that we did um, last time. But we'll just sort of give it a, the real quick refresher on how that goes. Um, if my computer decides to actually show it to us. All right, there it is. Oh wait, not, not video assignment, dang it. It's been that kind of day for me so far this morning, so hopefully we don't have technical difficulties during class. All right, so while I'm uh, futzing around with this, trying to get to the right assignment. Um, let me share with you a good, uh, a good bad joke. Um, one of the things I do for fun is I volunteer at the Nevada State Railroad Museum down in Carson City, where we operate um, steam locomotives from the uh, turn of the century, like turn of the 20th century, so um, over 100 years old. And one of the things that I do when I'm trying to kill time as we're waiting to get out of the depot or whatever is tell really, really bad jokes. So uh, just to give you a feel for them, I'm going to give you a math joke and then I'm also going to give you a uh, train joke. So here's your math joke first. Um, what did zero say to eight? Nice belt. Yeah, think about that one for a second. And then here's your real quick train joke. Um, what do you call a railroad worker who's been struck by lightning? A conductor. All right. Uh, so yeah, I know, I apologize, but not really. Um, all right, so I hopefully this is the one we're looking at. So a survey team was trying to estimate the height of a mountain above a level plane. Um, and we know that uh, from one point there's an elevation, angle of elevation of 24 degrees, and then if we move 1,500 feet closer, the angle of elevation is 29 degrees. How high is the mountain? So for those of you who are with us last time or saw last, uh, last class's video, we did one like this, and so um, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of show you the setup again. I don't know that I'm going to work it all the way through, but let me at least show you how we can set this up. So I'm just going to write down um, some of these numbers here, and then we will see what we can do. All right, so we've got 24 degree, 29 degree to the top of this mountain. All right. Okay, so I'm going to quit sharing my screen here so that we can go to the whiteboard. So let me switch real quick. All right, so here's our picture. We've got our mountain. We're trying to figure out the height of this guy. All right, so there's our mountain. We want H. And what we know are those angles of elevation. So we saw that they were 24 and 29 degrees. Obviously, yours might have different values. And we know that we moved closer by 1,500 feet. So that's the distance between those two points where we 
um, looked up at the top of the mountain. All right, so what we did is we threw in an unknown distance, the distance from the center of the mountain basically, to the second place where we did our angle of elevation. But now we're able to go ahead and use the trig functions to figure out which uh, one we need in order to find H. So if we look at this smaller triangle, we've got the smaller triangle with the 29 degrees and the sides are both unknown. We have H as our height and X as our distance away, but we can use tangent for this guy and we can get that the tangent of 29 degrees is equal to H over X. Now I can create another equation using the bigger triangle, the one with the 24 degree angle of elevation. Again, we don't know what the height is, it's H, but the horizontal side is now 1500 plus X, because if you come back and look at the original picture, we had our 1500 feet, another X, so a total of 1500 plus X. So similar thing can be done with the tangent. We get the tangent of 24 degrees is equal to H over 1500 plus X. And now we have two equations with two unknowns. And so we can go ahead and solve that system. So basically solve one of these for H or X, plug it into the other and then solve. So I think this is as far as I'm gonna take it this time. Um, if you want to see a better explanation or a complete workout of the problem, um, go check our video from Monday. Today's Wednesday, right? Yeah. So from Monday. And it will be somewhere near the beginning of the video in the first like 15 minutes or so. Um, and you'll see the complete work through. But hopefully this is at least a decent shove in the right direction. So, uh, Hava, do I get a thumbs up? We're kind of good. All right, excellent. All right, any other homework questions before we dive back into what we were talking about last time? Okay, hearing none, we will move along. So, last time, what we did just to kind of review and remind you, is we started looking at how we can figure out the trig function values for angles that are not in a right triangle, right? In a right triangle, we can use SOHCAHTOA and um, all those other things to help us remember and get the ratios of the sides. But once we get beyond 90 degrees or pi over two radians, we can't use the right triangle anymore. And so that's where we made use of the unit circle. So I wanna go ahead and show you something here. I'm gonna share the screen again. And I found a nice little app that was on, uh, it's actually a site from the University of Colorado. And um, you probably don't realize how much it pains me to share with you something from the University of Colorado because I actually went to Colorado State University and we're a little bit of rivals. Um, but this is a place that has a bunch of simulations of various types in math and science. And um, one that I found that I wanted to show you, it's called something like Trig Tour. And it really shows you how the unit circle um, can be used to figure out the different trig function values. So hopefully it doesn't take too long to get loaded. Hey, there it is. All right. So I'm just going to turn off some stuff here just to get it a little less cluttered. So this is a unit circle. You may remember that the unit circle, what's special about it is that the radius is one. That's why we call it unit. So uh, this is radius one. And we saw that the trig functions were defined by the X and Y coordinates of the point on the unit circle. Um, so like right now I've got cos, it's got cosine clicked. So showing you cosine and cosine is given as the X coordinate. So let me just move this up here a little bit. So now we have uh, a new angle. So notice that this angle is in degrees. It says it's 42 degrees. It gives us the coordinate of the point that is on the unit circle. That's the red dot. 
over here. So it's got an X coordinate of 0 0.743 and a Y coordinate of 0 0.669. So the cosine is defined as the X coordinate on the unit circle. If you just go to the definition in the triangle, good old SOHCAHTOA, remember cosine is your adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent is this blue length, this blue arrow. The hypotenuse, of course, is this long side. Well, the hypotenuse is the radius of the unit circle, so that's one. This blue is the x-coordinate. It's how far we have to go over to get to this point. And so that's why cosine is x over one, or just the x-coordinate. And then similarly, sine is the y-coordinate. So let's just click over here to sign, see if it keeps me at the same point. So now they just drew a little green arrow here going vertically. You notice it says sine is now y over one. Same idea, it's opposite over hypotenuse. And this time the y coordinate is 0 0.669. And so this is the beauty of the unit circle is that if we go anywhere on it, let's move to another place. Okay, so now you notice our angle, we're still in standard position. So it's from the positive x-axis rotating counterclockwise. So now we're at an angle of 138 degrees. You notice we get different x and y coordinates, but the sine is still the y. And if I go to cosine, it's the x. And then the other trig functions are defined similarly with their ratios of sides. And I kind of threw all those out at you last time. Um, the secant and cosecant are just going to be the reciprocals of cosine and sine. So secant would be one over x and sine is one over y. But then tangent is y over x. So let's take a look at tangent. So you notice now it says tangent is y equal to y over x. And now this value right here is no longer one of the x or y coordinates, right? We get a 0 0.9, negative 0 0.9. And that's not at all related to these two except that it is. It's the ratio of those two. So this one we can't just read off of the point, but we can create from the point. If you were to take your calculator and take 0.669 and divide by negative 0.743, that's going to give you negative 0.900. So this was all in degrees. Of course, if I click this to radians, it just gives me the radian equivalent. Notice there's no more degree symbol. Um, and we're used to seeing the radians with pi's in them, but they're just plain old numbers. So this angle, I forget, it was something like 138 degrees. Um, that's the equivalent of 2.409 radians if you multiply by pi over 180. Um, but notice that these values don't change because it's the same angle. All this radian versus degree thing does is change how we're labeling the size of that angle. It's like saying, the distance from the Y to state line is four miles, as opposed to saying, okay, the distance from Y to state line is 7.5 kilometers. It's still the same distance. We just are using a different number for it. So we'll come back and, and we're gonna kind of play around with this a little bit after we look at some patterns. But the other thing I wanted to show you, I'm gonna click on here, special angles. And when we go to special angles, notice that now there are just some specific dots that are drawn. And if I rotate, it just takes me from point to point on there. And those were the special angles that we created on our chart. So if you still have your chart from last time, if you've got that, uh, pull that out. If not, um, I am going to uh, go ahead and um, share my screen a little bit later with one of those so uh, with a completed chart so we can look at it. But these were our angles. This was the zero, right, in terms of radians. The next one is our pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two. And then, of course, we continue to two pi over three, three pi over four, five pi over six, and so on. Um, but you're noticing, hopefully you can notice that it's giving us the x's and y's that we saw before. And this little window right here is actually giving you the first three columns in that chart, sine, cosine, and tangent. Sine is one half, because it's the y coordinate. Cosine is minus root three over two. And then tangent is minus root three over three. And then we got the, all the other ones using the relationships we saw between the big three and the next three, which were that they're reciprocal. 
All right, so um, we're going to come back and we're going to look at this um, a little bit later after we talk about some of the patterns we saw on our chart. All right, so any questions on that before we slide away from this? Okay, well, let me stop the sharing here for a second. All right, so let me just sort of um, remind you what we did last time. So we went through um, all the different angles, the special angles, and we created the chart. Um, like I said, I'm gonna share with you that chart here in just a second. Um, I did put a completed, correct, uh, you know, a completed version of that chart up on Canvas. It's under the files. If you go look in the files, um, you can pull that up. So if you want to um, compare that against what you wrote out, or even if you just wanna print that one out yourself, uh, feel free. Um, but it's got all the values that we did last time. So let me go ahead and share that with you. And I want to talk about some of the patterns that we see in this chart. So give it a second here and it'll pop up. All right, there it is. So um, your chart should look something like this. So we've got a column that's got our degrees and then we've got our radians. So these are the radian equivalents of those degrees. And then we just wrote across the row the value of the six different trig functions. So let me just come down here a little bit. I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller so maybe we can see all of it. There we go. So hopefully that's still big enough for you to see. But this is what your chart should look like. So I started sharing some patterns last time and I want to uh, show you those patterns again and then talk about uh, some other patterns that we're seeing and how this all fits together. All right, so first things first. Notice the pattern on the sine values. So it started with zero, went to one half, root two over two, root three over two, and then one. And I don't know if you remember this, um, but I showed you that this is actually found by uh, taking the square root of zero over two, the square root of one over two, the square root of two over two, the square root of three over two, and the square root of four over two. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna pause the, pause the share here for a second. And let me switch screens. All right, so now you should be able to see the whiteboard. And for those values, again, it was zero, one half, root two over two, root three over two, and one. Notice that this is the square root of zero over two, the square root of one over two, the square root of two over two, the square root of three over two, and the square root of four over two. So these give you those values of zero, one half, root two over two, root three over two, and one. Now, I don't know if that's gonna help you in terms of remembering it. I just love that pattern. Um, there's no real rhyme or reason why that works, but it is kind of cool and it makes it really easy so that you can remember those first few in the sign column. All right, so if you've got that, if you know these values, let me show you how you can get the cosines. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the share. So hopefully y'all should be able to see it again. All right, so does everybody see the special angles chart again? I'm seeing a head nod and a couple thumbs up. Okay, so we got our sine, zero, one half, root two, root three over two, and one. Notice for the cosines, the pattern is exactly the same, just backwards. But we saw a reason for that. And in fact, that's why these functions got their names. Remember the co part of cosine means complementary. So the cosine is the sine of the complementary angle. Well, complementary just means adds up to 90 degrees or pi over two. So that's why the sine of zero is the same as the cosine of 90. 
and the sine of 30 degrees is the same as the cosine of 60 degrees and so on. So if you know those sine values, you can get those cosine values just in the opposite order. So basically you can think of this chunk of 10, instead of having to memorize those 10 entries, you only have to memorize five of them because you get the other five just by flipping them over. And that co pattern, that um, alternate order, the opposite order of values follows for tangent and cotangent as well. Look at the numbers for tangent. It goes down zero root three over three, one root three and undefined or DNE. And for cotangent, it's the same, just the other direction. So zero root three over three, one root three undefined as we work our way up. All right, so that's kind of nice. And that pattern also is true with the secant and the cosecant. If you look at secant's numbers and you look at cosecant's numbers, we see the same thing happen in terms of the pattern. All right, so basically what I just did for you is I cut your work down um, by half by noticing that pattern. Well, even a little bit better we're going to see that you don't even need um, all of that to get the rest. I'm going to show you some other um, things that we know about these guys. Uh, but let's go back to the fact that the big three tell us the next three. So if we already know sine, we immediately know cosecant because it's flipped over. If we know cosine, we know secant because it's flipped over. Same thing with tangent and cotangent. So basically, I've made it so that at worst, all we need are tangent and sine. If you know sine, then you get cosine, you get cosecant. Cosine gives you secant. And then if you know tangent, you get cotangent. Well, I'll show you in a little bit how we can get tangent from sine and cosine so that we don't even really need to know that column. All right, now, the next pattern I want you to notice and we saw this last time that when we went into these next angles, these angles that were bigger than 90 degrees, we saw that we got the same numbers popping up. The only things that changed were some plus or minus signs, right? Like look at this one for 210 degrees, which is same as seven pi over six. And notice the values are one half root three over two, root three over three, root three, right? Two root three over three, two. Those are exactly the same as those for pi over six. It's just some of them have minus signs. So I don't know if I can highlight. No, I can't highlight. But I want you to notice, look at pi over 6. Look at 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, and 11 pi over 6. So all the ones that have a 6 in the denominator of those fractions, those four rows all have the same values. It's just some of them are plus and some of them are minus. Similarly, all the ones that have a four on the bottom, pi over four, three pi over four, five pi over four, seven pi over four, same story. Those four all have the same values. They're different than the ones for the pi over sixes, but the pi over fours all have the same values. Again, just different plus or minus signs. And notice that also pi over three, we get the same deal. Right, whether it with the pi over three, two pi over three, four pi over three, and five pi over three. So there's another reason I like the radians is it helps you see these patterns a little bit better. All right, so then the question really comes, how can we tell when we go to one of these bigger ones, like a three pi over four or something like that, how do we tell which ones are positive and which ones are negative? So let's just kind of look at the patterns and I'm gonna use the quadrantal angles, the 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360. Remember those are the special ones because they show up on the axes. Um, I'm gonna use those to kind of break us up because if you look between zero and 90, so that's these three right here, notice that everything is positive. There's not a single negative in there. So everything is positive. If we go to the second, set, the ones between 90 degrees and 180 degrees. Notice which ones are positive. We've got sine and cosecant. 
the fact that those two are both positive shouldn't surprise you because whatever happens to sine is going to happen to cosecant since they're reciprocals. So like of the big three, only sine is positive. Everything else is negative. Well, jump down to between 180 and 270. So we're going to look at these guys. In here of the big three, we notice tangent is the only one that's positive. Again, cotangent is positive, but it must be. But of the big three, only tangent. And then if we get past 270 and go from 270 to 360, down there, notice only the cosine is positive. So in each of those regions, in each of those realms, we're seeing that we get a different positive um, depending upon where we are. So I'm going to go back to the whiteboard real quick. Because I want to draw a picture so you can see what we were seeing here. So can everybody see the whiteboard? No whiteboard? Let me do that. Okay, so we see the whiteboard? All right, awesome. So let me go ahead and draw the unit circle like we saw. So remember those quadrantal angles are the ones that give us the axes. So what I'm going to do is over here, I'm going to write zero because that was an angle of zero. Up here, I'm going to write pi over two because when we went straight up, that was an angle of pi over two. On the left, we're going to make that a pi. And on the bottom, we're going to make that a three pi over two. You can also do this with the degrees, but I want to start getting this thing in radians. And then once we came back around to zero, this was two pi again. So those angles, those special angles we saw, that first set that were between zero and pi over two, those were the angles that were up in here. So this is the first quadrant. If you've not heard of this before, let me just make sure. So quadrant, quad means four. And so the real number, or sorry, the ag, but so the coordinate plane can get broken into four pieces by these axes. The one that's up here, we call this one quadrant one. So it's the first quadrant. And what we saw here is that they were all positive. So no matter which one we are looking at, they were always positive. Now, when we went to that second chunk in here, this is now quadrant two. And we use Roman numerals for the numbering of these guys. But this is quadrant two, the second quadrant. And in here, what we saw was that only the sign was positive. So of the big three, only sign was positive. Once we got past pi, or 180 degrees, and we looked in that next chunk, this is now quadrant three. And in quadrant three, what we saw was that it was tangent that was positive. And the sine and cosine were negative. And then lastly, obviously, this one's going to be quadrant four, and the fourth quadrant. And in this group, we saw that the cosine was positive. And this is always the case. No matter what the angle is, if its terminal side lies in one of these quadrants, we know that this one of the big three is going to be positive, as opposed to in the first quadrant, everything was positive. So why is this? Well, it comes back to the definitions. Remember what sine was. Sine was the y coordinate. And so if we think about being on the circle, the places where the y-coordinate is positive, that's where we're above the x-axis, that's going to happen in quadrants one and two. So that's why sine was positive in quadrant one and also in quadrant two, but not in quadrant three or four, because now the y-coordinates are negative. Similarly, look at cosine. Cosine is defined as x 
And so the X coordinate is going to be positive when we're to the right of the Y axis, which is in quadrants one and four. So again, that's why we saw cosine positive down here and also in the first quadrant, but negative in the other two. Now, tangent's a little bit trickier, but tangent is y over x. So you're taking the two coordinates and you're dividing them. So the reason it shows up positive down here is in this quadrant, both x and y are negative. And when you divide a negative by a negative, you get a positive. Similarly, in the first quadrant, positive divided by a positive gives you a positive. But in quadrants two and four, the x and y coordinates have opposite sign. One's positive and one's negative, which makes those negative. So you can see by how we define these things that when we're in the unit circle, it must be that we get these plus or minus signs in the various quadrants. So what this does for us is basically makes it so that all you have to know is the top part of that chart. If you know the first quadrant angles, you can get all the other ones just by copying the values and then making sure that you have the right plus or minus signs depending upon which quadrant. So while that chart may look a little daunting because it's so big, it's actually not that bad if we start seeing the patterns. So let me give you another little mnemonic device, one of those little memory devices to help you with remembering what's what in terms of the positive. And it goes something like this. If I write it down here, hopefully you guys can still see it. It's all students take calculus. There are some variations. Um, the first one I ever learned was all students take classes, but all students should take calculus anyway. So we're gonna go with all students take calculus. And here's how this works. Here's how this tells you which ones are positive. So in the first quadrant, remember that they are all positive. So all students tell you that all of them are positive. When we go to the next, students. Well, students starts with an S. And so this tells you in the second quadrant, sign is positive because of the big three, that's the only one that starts with S. So all students take, there's your T, tells you that the tangent is positive in quadrant three. And then calculus starts with C. So there's your fourth quadrant positive. So that little mnemonic device, all students take calculus, is just telling you what's positive. And it just goes in order, first through fourth quadrants. And just remember, we're talking about the big three. We're not caring about um, cotangent or secant or cosecant because we really only need to know about the big three. All right, so not too bad, right? Let me go back. I'm going to share the screen again. And we're going to go back to that trig tour. And I just want to show you that if we get away from the special angles, so we're just going to allow ourselves to go wherever, I want you to notice what happens to the values of sine, cosine, and tangent. So right now it's tangent. So let's start at the very beginning. We're going to drop back down to zero. So we've got an angle of zero radians or zero degrees. Now, if we've got a first quadrant angle, so there is a random first quadrant angle. Notice that the tangent is positive. And in fact, that value is positive. Just look at the, watch this number as I move it around. You notice that the value changes as it should because it's a ratio of the two sides, but it's always positive when we're here in the first quadrant. Now, as soon as I get past the Y axis and I jump into the second quadrant, Notice that now the tangent is negative and it's going to stay negative no matter where I am in this quadrant. Again, the values change, but negative. Now, if I slide into the third quadrant, you'll notice that it's positive again because 
it's y divided by x, right? So y divided by x, they're both negatives, which means their quotient is positive. It's positive, again, changes values. And then as soon as we get to the fourth quadrant, again, the sign changed and it's negative. All right, now, if I continue past, I've got an angle that's now bigger than two pi. Let me go to degrees so you can see it's bigger than 360. But the terminal side is still in the first quadrant. And so tangent is still positive. So I could do a bunch of loops, right? I have no idea how many loops I've done now. I'm getting dizzy. But if we look at this guy, we're still in the second quadrant. Yeah, the angle is 27.41 radians, whatever that means. But in the second quadrant, we know tangent is negative. And we see that. Um, it also works if you go backwards. So if we had rotated in a negative direction, let me undo all of these extra spins. Oof. Okay, so here we're back to zero ish. But now I could go the other direction. I could go clockwise. Notice my angle is now negative, but that doesn't change the fact. Like in here, tangent is still negative because we're in the fourth quadrant. So similar things happen with sine and cosine. Let me just show you cosine really quickly. So we're in the fourth quadrant, cosine is positive. And we know that. I slide into the third quadrant and now my cosine is negative. If I'm up in the second quadrant, my cosine is still negative because my x coordinate is negative. And then if I'm in the first quadrant, it's positive and so on. So it's just how these things work out according to their definition that the signs follow this pattern. All right, so there's a little bit to help you in terms of um, finding all of the values, even if you only know the beginning. All right, so how are we feeling about that? Not too bad? Thumbs up? All right, cool. Um, so now let's talk about some relationships between the trig functions. We've already seen some, right? We've already seen like the reciprocal nature. That's why we can only worry about the big three. We don't have to worry about the others. But there are even more relationships between these that um, really help us when it comes time to try to find trig values. We can actually get away with knowing only one and still be able to build the rest if we spot all the patterns. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna jump back to the whiteboard and I'm gonna show you the identities we've already seen, we've already established in terms of the relationship between these guys, but we're gonna add a couple more, a couple other things that um, are definitely relationships between sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. So let me start by putting up what we've already figured out. And I'll try to kind of group these guys together. So we first had what we called the reciprocal identities. And we pretty much talked about these, or were introduced to these the first day we talked about the trig functions, because this was, uh, this kind of came about just by looking at the relationship in terms of the ratios of sides of a triangle. And so what we know is that cotangent is the same as one over tangent. We know that secant is the same as one over cosine. And we know that cosecant is the same as one over sine. So I'm just gonna put a box around those. So those are our reciprocal identities. So we know that this is true no matter what the angle is. And if you look at your chart, even with those special angles, we see that this relationship holds in those columns, that the one is just the flip of the other. All right, so these we've seen already. What's more interesting are these next ones. So the next ones, uh, I call these the quotient identities. I think that's what this book calls them as well. But the first one 
is that tangent is equal to sine divided by cosine. And then the second one is that cotangent is actually equal to cosine over sine. So there are your reciprocal identity, or sorry, quotient identity. So first of all, why they're called quotient identities is because they are a fraction. Remember, quotient is the math fancy word for fraction. And so we've got that the tangent is a fraction of sine and cosine. Um, you should be good with, if the first one is true, if tangent equals sine over cosine, then cotangent must be cosine over sine because of the fact that it's the reciprocal. All right, well, why is tangent equal to sine over cosine? Why must that be? Well, it all comes back to the definitions. If we go back to the definition, we saw that the tangent of theta was equal to y over x. It was the ratio of the y coordinate and the x coordinate. But you may remember that the x is actually just the cosine and y is the sine. And so this is a simple, just direct substitution. If we let y equal sine and x equal cosine, then tangent is sine over cosine. So I mentioned earlier how you don't really need to know tangent, and this is why. Because if you know sine and cosine, you can just divide them and you get your tangent. All right, so there are the quotient identities. They seem kind of boring probably, but they're gonna be really, really, really useful. All right, so now let me give you the next set. And these are called the Pythagorean identities. And there are three of them. So with the name like Pythagorean identities, you can probably guess that they have something to do with the Pythagorean theorem. And they do, and they do. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the first one. We'll see where that comes from, why that has to be. And then I'm gonna develop the next two for you. So here's the first one. The first one says sine squared theta, plus cosine squared theta equals one. Before we go too far with this, I just want to point out something because this might be new to you. The fact that this square is not all the way on the outside. And what this means, when we write sine squared theta, what that really means is that we're taking sine of theta and we're squaring that whole number. Okay, so this is just a mathematical shorthand. And the reason that we have that is because if I just wrote sine theta squared and I don't have any parentheses, the question is, are we squaring the angle? or are we squaring the sign? And so to alleviate that confusion, we put that power right after the trig function to tell us that it's actually the entirety of this, all of sine theta is being squared. And what I wrote here the second time is really the same as writing with parentheses sine of theta squared. And notice that we're doing something different now. We're actually squaring the angle then we're taking the sign. And so we're gonna get a different number if we do that. All right, well, if we come back to this, what this is saying is if you take the sine value and square it, and you take the cosine value and you square it, if you add those up, you get one. All right, so why? Why is that what happens when we take 
sine and cosine? Why is it when we square and we get one? Well, it's easy enough explanation as go back to the unit circle. So if we go back to the unit circle, you guys remember its equation from last time? What the equation is of that circle? I love the few people I can actually see. I see them thumbing through their notes, putting their hands up on the keyboard. Well, I'll help you out. It's x squared plus y squared equals one. Right. Okay, so William just threw in the x squared plus y squared. Thank you for that in the chat. Um, so it's x squared plus y squared equals one. If you recall for a circle, there's that x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Well, the r squared, our radius is one. That's why that's one. And then the h and k come from our center. The center here is the origin, so they both disappear, and we're left with x squared plus y squared equals one. Also, if you want to remember where that came from, it was actually just the Pythagorean theorem. If I draw a little right triangle here, I've got my x coordinate is the horizontal length, my y coordinate is the vertical length, one is my hypotenuse. Pythagorean theorem gives us x squared plus y squared equals one. All right, well now, remember how x and y are defined in terms of the trig functions. x, that's the cosine. So we're gonna have cosine of theta squared. The y, that's our sine. So we have sine of theta squared equals one. So if you just go to that, well, this is how we write powers of sine. We bring that square inside. You can swap the order on these because it's addition and it's commutative. And the next thing you know, you've got the Pythagorean identity of sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So that's where that one comes from. Let me go ahead and write this again. So the first one is sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. All right, I promise you in five years, if I ask you something about trig and ask you about identities, this is the one you're gonna remember. I promise you, because we're gonna use it a lot. Um, ask the calculus students. Next time you're online with one of the tutors or something and you're ch chatting with them, um, ask them which identity they use the most. They'll all rattle that one off. That is by far the biggest. All right, so there is one of the Pythagorean identities. There are actually three of them. So we'll go ahead and build the other two as well. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take this one, the one that we just created, and I'm gonna do some algebra on it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna multiply both sides by one over cosine squared. And it might feel weird that I'm multiplying by one over cosine squared. Um, it's not random. It's just, it's gonna do what I want it to do. That's why I'm gonna do this. Um, sometimes I call these the miracle step where you're looking at something and you go, why did that happen? And you go, well, it must be, you know, a miracle. The, the math gods on high came down and said, do this. Um, but it really is, it gets us where we wanna be. So check out what happens. If I do that, I'm gonna get sine squared over cosine squared plus cosine squared over cosine squared equals one over cosine squared. So the cosine squared over cosine squared, that just cancels and leaves me a one. 
So I'm going to write there plus one. Look at this first term. I have sine squared over cosine squared. Well, not that long ago, within the last five minutes, we just uh, saw what sine over cosine was. So what's sine over cosine? What did that equal from our ratio? Tangent. Oh, thanks, Hala. She just yelled in tangent. So that's a tangent. Since these are being squared, that's just going to be the tangent squared. So sine over cosine turns into tangent. So sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared. And then the cosine squared is reduced to 1. Now if we look on the right-hand side, same kind of deal. We've got 1 over cosine squared. Well, we know what 1 over cosine is. Which trig function is 1 over cosine? Secant. All right, that was secant. So this is going to be the same as secant squared. So there's a second form for our Pythagorean. So this is the second Pythagorean identity. It's tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. So we'll put that up here. Tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. Now, this one's not as useful as sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. But you will definitely see this in calculus. I promise you. In second quarter, specifically, when you do this thing called trig substitution, you'll use this. All right, so there's the second form. And then the third form, we actually find in an identical manner. We're going to take the original sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. But this time, instead of dividing by cosine, we're going to divide by sine. So imagine that we multiplied both sides of this by 1 over sine squared. This is what our identity turns into. The sine squared is reduced down to a 1. And then if we make use of the other identities again, cosine over sine, that's cotangent. So this would be cotangent squared. And 1 over sine, that's the same as cosine. So there's the third one. It's 1 plus cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared. Now, what I like about this one and the second one is if you look at these, just change all the functions to cos, and that's the third. Cotangent squared plus 1 equals cosecant squared. I know that the order here is written in a different way, but it's addition, so it's commutative. You can swap it. So really, getting the third one from the second one is just a matter of changing from those functions to their co-functions. All right, well, let me go ahead and write that one up here as well. So we've got this completed. And so here are our three Pythagorean identities. All right, well, now, with these identities, with this whole set, we can actually get all of the trig functions if we know one of them. All right. So if we just know one of the one of the six, we can actually build all the rest. So I'm going to show you how we do that. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little story about Pythagoras. So I don't know how much you know about Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras was a guy. Uh, there was a human named Pythagoras. Um, he was Greek. And um, this was probably about, I want to say, 2000 BC. Maybe not quite that early, but um, still quite a ways ago. Um, but Pythagoras did not come up with the Pythagorean theorem. He didn't. Um, in fact, the Pythagorean theorem was known um, by the Chinese. We do know that there are uh, uh, transcripts that still exist that the Chinese knew this. Uh, it was known by the Babylonians, which is like a modern day Iraq area. Uh, there are clay tablets that have 
um, these Pythagorean triples, these whole numbers that satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so we knew, uh, we know other cultures knew it, but even amongst the Greeks, Pythagoras was not the one who came up with this. Um, Pythagoras was basically a cult leader. Uh, that's what we would call him today. Um, and he was in charge of a little mathematical cult. I just like telling this story because think about what a mathematical cult must have been like, right? Um, but they were into what's called numerology. And numerology is uh, basically the idea that numbers um, define everything. And like your future and everything is determined by specific numbers. So like you might look at the day you were born and it has nothing to do with star position or anything like that. So we're not talking about, oh, you're a Gemini or you're a Pisces. No, this is like strictly number based. Um, and so they did all kinds of things with numbers, but like any good cult leader, he took credit for everything. So one of his little underlings figured this out. And, was, and so Pythagoras is like, oh, great. Here's a new theorem from us. So it's the Pythagorean theorem. Well, um, some other things about this cult that uh, are a little bit interesting. Um, they were vegetarians, which at the time was pretty rare, right? Um, that, that was kind of unique, but even more rare or more unusual is that when you join this cult, you had to take a vow of silence for a year. So for an entire year, you couldn't say anything. You could come to their little meetings and listen to them talk about math, but you couldn't say a word. If you did, you were booted. Um, they were also really, really secretive. They didn't want people to know their secrets. Um, they are kind of a mathematical mob. Um, one of the members at one point shared something that um, basically Pythagoras and the leaders didn't want to be known. And they literally took him into the Mediterranean, tied a rock around his legs and threw him overboard. So, um, and this is fact, I mean, at least as factual as anything in history is. So I'm not just making this up. Um, but they were kind of crazy. They were definitely a little crazy. Oh, and just so you know, the secret that was spilled is that there are numbers that are not rational. Basically, they figured out looking at the Pythagorean theorem, you know how we get square roots all the time. Um, those are irrational numbers. And so one of them, uh, they figured that out and that really didn't sit well with them because uh, you know, numerology, it's all about nice numbers, whole numbers. I mean, I guess you can do a fraction, I guess because at least it's whole numbers. But square root of two, you just couldn't like do. So anyway, um, they let this out or this guy let this out and uh, they shut him up real fast. Anyway, so we're, we're a little crazy. We're a little crazy. So William, is that a, you're asking me a question or you just think that's a great story? I, just, I think that's pretty funny, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and it is kind of, I like learning about that kind of stuff to realize that humanity is humanity. Like you, you look at what's going on in the world, you know, even now with how people are and how they behave, it's not different. Humans have been like this in throughout recorded history. Obviously there are different things that we care about, different issues, but uh, all the lunacy, it, it carries on and uh, you get some really quirky people with quirky stories. So, uh, so where did I learn all this math history? Um, I actually took a math history class. It was one of the uh, classes that I took for a math major. Um, and I read up a lot. I, I, I really enjoy history. Um, I'm kind of a weird math guy in that I like things that are not just math, if you know what I mean, right? I'm not your typical math math guy. Um, I love to read. I really love history. I really love learning about history of um, cultures that are not mine. Like European history, we all kind of know just because it's part of our life. So I like to learn um, other histories. Um, specifically, I'm really big into the Maya. I've gone down to Central America lots of times. Um, they had some really, really cool math and architecture. Um, but yeah, so I learned all this from class and from reading. So, And a lot of it actually comes from students. They'll ask me questions. They'll be like, oh, what do you know about so-and-so? And, -so? and um, I'll look into it at least. Uh, maybe I can find some fun stories. So I promise this won't be the last time you hear something um, kind of funny math history-wise in this class. All right, well, let's get back then to um, how we can use these identities to get all of them knowing just one. So I'm gonna go to the whiteboard and I'm gonna give you a trig function and we're gonna talk about how we can figure 
figure out all the other ones from that one value. So hopefully you have your identities written down somewhere. I can't keep them all up on the board. If we were actually in the classroom, I would have just kept one section of the board with all these identities up, but um, we're just gonna kind of have to go with it. But let me just tell you this. Let's say I've got an angle where I know the cosine of that angle. And that cosine, let's say it's two thirds. So we've got some sort of an angle where the cosine is equal to two thirds. And what I want is I want to get all of the other five. So basically we're just going to write a list here. We're going to have sine of theta equals. I'll go ahead and put cosine here just to be complete. But then we also want tangent, we want cotangent, we want secant, and we want cosecant. Okay, so that's gonna be our goal. We're just gonna fill this in. But I've only given you one, and so we're gonna see if we can actually get all the rest. Now, one of them should be really easy. One of them you shouldn't really have to think much to get. Which one? All right, so Kai just typed up secant, and that's exactly right. You'll hear me say, you get one of them for free, and that, in this case, this is secant, and we're gonna get secant for free because we know secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Remember the reciprocal identities, the big three lead to the others, so the one that's paired with cosine of the non-big three, the little three, is secant, and so we know that the secant is three halves. All right, boom, we're one fifth of the way done. And it didn't really require much thought. Okay, so now we need to find the others. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make use of the Pythagorean identity. I'm gonna use the Pythagorean identity that involves cosine. Similarly, I could use the one that involves secant. But we're going to use the cosine mostly because I like sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. It's my favorite of the Pythagoreans. So let's put in the value we know for cosine. We know cosine is two thirds. So we're going to get two thirds squared equals one. So let's take that two thirds and square it. So that's going to be four ninths, square the two, square the three. So that guy's four ninths, so that equals one. So I can start solving this for sine. So I'll subtract four ninths. So one minus four ninths is five ninths. And now to get sine, I just have to take the square root. So I get the sine of theta is the square root of five ninths which is the same as the square root of five over three. So by knowing cosine, we were able to get sine using the Pythagorean identity. Not nearly as easy as finding secant, but we've got it. So this is the square root of five over three. Okay, so Diego just asked on the chat, would it be positive and negative because of the square root? Okay, so very good question. It's a very good question. Because when you take a square root, we do know that we should put plus or minus. And um, so Diego, I'm giving you some bonus points. I mean, they're like mental bonus points. But I'm gonna give you some bonus points here for catching that. And we'll talk about plus or minus in just a second. Okay, so I'm not ignoring this question. I am going to address it, but in just a minute. Okay, well, we've got sine, but now that we've got sine, we get another one for free. What are we going to get now that we know sine? Which of the other three can we do really fast? Okay, so a couple of you are throwing in cosecant. 
because cosecant, all you have to do is flip sine over. So the cosecant is going to be 3 over the square root of 5. And if you want to rationalize that, feel free. I'm going to leave it as it is. All right. So all that's left are tangent and cotangent. But we have relationships for those as well. So another identity we've got is that the tangent is equal to sine over cosine. Well, I've got those two numbers. So sine is root 5 over 3. Cosine is 2 over 3. So if I just turn that division into multiplication, this is root 5 over 3 times 3 over 2, which is root 5 over 2. So there's our tangent, root 5 over 2. And so cotangent is just that thing flipped over. So there you go. We have all six of them just by knowing one. So this is kind of the power of the trig identities. And the fact that these things are all related is that you really only need to know a little bit. If you know one thing, that's all you need. If you know one, you can get all the rest. Now, there is one issue we still have to talk about, and that's that positive and negative thing that Diego brought up. And, and we'll go back and look at that. But barring that, notice that everything just sort of falls right out. So this is one of the nice things about the identities. And it, another nice thing about it is since it only matters about one of them, suppose we had an equation that had a bunch of trig functions in it. If we can kind of break it down so that they all turn into the one that matters, it's going to make it a lot easier to solve. So this is something that we're going to see a lot coming up. Um, and I think it's in the next chapter, in chapter eight, where we're going to spend a lot of time doing algebra with trig and the identities are going to be our friends. Okay, well, let's go address that plus or minus. And I also want to show you one more way that we could have done this that doesn't involve the identities that some of you might like a little bit better. So when we started with this cosine of theta equals two thirds, and I just dove into using the identities, Another approach is to draw a generic triangle. So here's our generic right triangle with the theta. And what you can do is you can take these numbers, whatever they are, and put them in as lengths of sides according to how cosine or whatever your trig function is are defined. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent side would be length two, and the hypotenuse would be length three. So if this had been sine of theta, well, we would use opposite over hypotenuse. If it was tangent of theta, opposite over adjacent. If this is a whole number, like let's say it had been tangent of theta equals five, and then we had to try to build this, you could just make it five over one, and then put those numbers in and so on. But now what we could do is we could actually get this third side using the Pythagorean theorem. So we've got 2 squared plus x squared equals 3 squared. So that's 4 plus x squared equals 9, x squared equals 5, and we get x is equal to the square root of 5. And yes, Diego, same deal, plus or minus. But notice, now that we know that this is the square root of 5, if we want to build the other trig ratios, it's as easy. So sine, opposite over hypotenuse, root 5 over 3. Tangent, opposite over adjacent, root 5 over 2. And then everything else spills out. So you might look at this and go, why the hell didn't you just show this to us first? This right triangle thing is way easier. How come you didn't do that? Well, the reason I didn't do that is this right triangle stuff only works if we have a right triangle. 
which means our angle has to be between zero and 90 degrees or has to be in the first quadrant. And there are plenty of times where that's not the case. So, and this definitely leads me to that plus or minus thing. So when I did this, what I was assuming when I just went to that positive is that I'm in the first quadrant. But it's very possible that there's another angle that would give me the same cosine. In fact, let me draw the coordinates here. So think about this one that's in the first quadrant. It gave us a cosine of two thirds. But which other quadrant has cosine positive? All right, so William just typed in four. Yep, it's the fourth quadrant. The fourth quadrant is down here. So similarly, I could have had another angle. So let's just run this guy out here. So there's another angle that's still going to have the cosine of two thirds. Because if we're on a unit circle, right, the coordinates of this point are going to be two thirds root five over three. Okay, so there's our unit circle. It's two thirds and root five over three because that's the cosine and the sine. Remember it's x comma y. So then down here, there's a symmetric point. Its x coordinate is still two thirds, but its y coordinate is minus five thirds. So when we first calculated the sine, when we first used the Pythagorean identity and I took that square root and then Diego said, shouldn't it be plus or minus? Yeah, the minus is still definitely possible. We just would be in the fourth quadrant. And I want you to think about what would have happened to these values had we been down here instead. Well, the sine is obviously a minus root five over three, so that'd have a minus sign on it. And so therefore cosecant would also be minus. Tangent is still two thirds, that was given. So secant is still three halves. But then tangent and cotangent also would have been negative. So when I said all you needed to know was one trig function, I wasn't 100% honest. What we need to know not only is one trig function, but where the terminal side of that angle is. Which quadrant is it in? because the quadrant will then tell you the plus or minus signs for everything else. What I did know at the start, if you had told me cosine is equal to two thirds, I already know I'm in either quadrant one or four. Those are my only options for cosine to be positive. But if you tell me then, if I'm in one or four, I'll know exactly what all the trig values are. Otherwise, I'll just know them off by potentially a minus sign. All right, so knowing one, we can get all the rest. So know your identities, because the identities are gonna be useful when we're somewhere else, not in the first quadrant. But if you're in the first quadrant, feel free to draw a right triangle, use the Pythagorean theorem, and then go crazy. But I'm going to keep showing you stuff with identities for a couple of reasons. One is it's more robust. It takes care of other situations. But also I want you, and I'm pointing to all of you, to get comfortable with the identities because we're going to make use of, we're going to use them a lot. All right. So let's go back and look at that chart. I'm going to pull back up the um, trig function uh, value chart that we created the other day. Um, but before I run over there, any questions on what we just did? We feeling okay? You're more concerned about this quiz that's going to start in like 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me just show you one more thing uh, before we call it a day and, and I turn you loose on the quiz. And um, so let me pull up this completed trig chart again and share it with you. So hopefully you'll see it here in just a second. 
All right. So the one other thing I wanted to look at is check out the top, reading from the top down versus from the bottom up. And I want you to look at this in all of the different trig functions. So if you look at sine, we have the zero, one half, root two over two, root three over two, one. Notice on the bottom, it's doing the same thing reading up, it's just the signs are different. Right, it's still zero, one half, root two over two, root three over two, one, it's just negative. And so the bottom half versus the top half, if you were to read from the top down and from the bottom up to the middle, it's actually symmetric. They're exactly the same values, just one's plus and one's negative. Um, the actual word we use for that in math is it's anti-symmetric. It's got the same values, just opposite signs. Well, I want you to notice that that same pattern holds for tangent, for cotangent, and for cosecant. So for everything but cosine and secant, if you read down and you read up, you're going to see the same value showing up just with opposite signs. Cosine and secant are a little bit different because those, if you read down and you read up, they're identical. So they're actual, there's actually perfect symmetry with those. But the fact that we're seeing those show up in kind of the same way kind of matters and is actually a way that we describe functions in general. The one other thing I want to talk about before I leave this is if we read up, I want you to think about that as we're doing negative angles. Because if I do negative angles, I'm going in the opposite direction. And so if I start at 360, that's the same as going at zero. But I were to move the other way, this is now negative 30 degrees, negative 45, negative 60, negative 90, negative 120, and so on. So we're getting the same degree numbers as the top, just negatives. So let me go to the board. So again, what we were seeing is that if I rotate in a counterclockwise direction, in the positive direction, and I went some angle, let's just call this guy theta, we saw that when we are going the other direction, so now this is negative theta, we saw a pattern in terms of the um, the trig function values, that for cosine and secant, we got exactly the same thing. And for sine, tangent, cotangent, and cosecant, we got the opposites. So in kind of an expression, what we're seeing, like with the sine and cosine and so on, let me just write this. We write sine of negative theta, cosine of negative theta, tangent of negative theta. We'll do it for the big three because we know the other three are just going to follow suit with their buddy function from the reciprocal identities. So take cosine. When we did cosine, we got exactly the same thing if we went in the positive direction. So cosine is kind of cool. It turns out it doesn't matter which way you go, you're going to get the same value. Sine, however, we saw that we got a change in the value of the plus or minus sign on it. And so the sine of minus theta is the same as the negative sine of theta. So that one, we got the same magnitude, just a different plus or minus sign. And then tangent did exactly the same thing. So I don't know if you remember this from algebra, but we have a name for these kinds of functions. The ones where when you go in the negative direction, you get the same thing or the opposite. And the word for that is either even or odd. So even functions, those were the ones that if you plug in the negative 
you get the same thing as if you plug in the positive. So this is an even function. An odd function, if you plug in a negative, you get the negative f of x. So this is just definition of an even and odd. It has nothing to do with trig, has everything to do with functions. And so you've seen functions that are like this. For example, absolute value of x is an even function. Um, the cube root of x is an odd function. You've just you've seen a bunch. But here's what's kind of cool. The six trig functions, every one of them is either even or odd. So here's our list. The even ones are cosine and secant. Because cosine, we got the same values as we read up, as we read down. And then all the other four, we had that pattern of the negatives. So that means that they are all odd. This is gonna come in handy when we draw their graphs. Because even and odd has something to do with the symmetry of the graphs, if you may, you might recall that. Um, if you don't, that's all right. I will be sure to explain it when we get there. All right, so all trig functions are either even or odd. And that's another pattern that we can see from that chart. All right, well, I'm gonna wrap it up here because we've got a quiz to take. So let me just go ahead and pause the recording.